The village of San Simon is in the state of Usulutan. It lies along the Limpa River, where Salvadoran armed forces massacred 200 civilians, mostly women and children, in 1981. Residents of San Simon say government forces in U.S. supplied planes and helicopters bomb and strafe them an average of two to four times a year. When we visited San Simon on December 9, 1990, the village had been attacked that morning. The first time I said, please stop torturing me. I, can, I cannot say what you want me to say I am, because I am not who you say I am. And if you feel I'm a burden to the society, kill me, kill me, I yelled. Many Americans don't know what's done with their tax money. Their taxes are used to bomb houses full of children, old people and women. And they don't know it. We catch up with what's been happening in El Salvador, the terrible things that have been happening in El Salvador. We'll show you two documentaries produced by Access Producers in Santa Barbara and an interview with a member of CISPES right now on Alternative Views. One of the results of the establishment media's tail wagging after the Gulf War has been to eliminate news from other parts of the world. El Salvador is our focus on alternative views. We'll have an interview with Charlie McMartin, who is a member of the committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador. And we'll have two documentaries by Susan and Edward de Brava from their series Behind the Headlines, which is a public access program in Santa Barbara, California. The main documentary is Human Rights in El Salvador, which was shown to a congressional committee. It features people from a wide variety of areas from El Salvador, from the city to the country, people who've been tortured, people who supervise the torturers. Well, it's very shocking. But before we see the documentary, here's some news from the alternative press. The Covert Action Information Bulletin of summer 1991 has an excellent article on a series of covert operations that were active in the Gulf War that exposes the full range of CIA and covert option, operation involvement in this operation. One of the most interesting revelations in the Covert Action Information Bulletin story indicates why the smart bombs were smart. We saw during the first days of the war these videos of this precision bombing in which these high-tech laser-guided, computer-guided bombs went through air shafts of defense industry buildings, hit their targets right on the, the spot and totally destroyed them. Later in the war, it came out that only a small percentage of the bombs dropped were actually smart, something like 7%. And then even a large percentage of these smart bombs missed their targets. The Philadelphia Inquirer suggests that perhaps 60% of the smart bombs hit their targets. Well, why did all these early bombs hit their targets? Well, according to some information gathered by the Covert Action Information Bulletin, the first bombs and missiles had an undisclosed advantage over some of the later bombs in that they were guided by homing devices at or near the targets that were planted by U.S. agents in Iraq before the war started. In other words, special forces infiltrated Baghdad and other military targets around Iraq and put these special homing devices on some of the buildings, some of the targets that were to be hit, so that the laser-guided bombs were more or less directly guided by electronic homing devices that brought them right into the targets, whereas later, of course, they didn't have that luxury 
when they were doing their targeting later and missing so many of their targets and causing the collateral damage that became increasingly um, obvious. There was also an ex another extremely interesting uh, revelation. One of these special operations that might have planted homing devices before the war was a secret helicopter mission in which the special operations forces had Soviet-made helicopters that were camouflaged as if they were Iraqi military equipment. Just a few days before the war started, there was an article that was in the New York Times and all the other media that six Iraqi helicopters had defected to the Saudis. This was announced by the Saudi government. The Pentagon made this announcement as if this was a p important piece of evidence that the Iraqi troops were collapsing in their morale. They weren't going to fight. They wanted to defect. So a lot was made of this story. A couple days afterwards, this was denied first by the Pentagon and then by the Saudis. And later research, research according to Covert Action Information Bulletin, indicated that the actual event happened in that the special operation forces that had just been on secret mission in Iraq flew back in Iraqi appearing helicopters and military uniforms, told the Saudis that they were defectors, that they wanted to land in Saudi airspace, and the Saudis thought that, yeah, this is great. We'll pick them up and we'll have some helicopters. We'll have a big propaganda vision uh, victory. And the Pentagon didn't even know about this operation. It was so secret. They put out the uh, first announcements. They had to retract and cover over the story. Well, according to the Covert Action Information Bulletin, this is a war crime. This violates the Geneva Convention that you're not supposed to um, to dress your soldiers in the clothes and to utilize the equipment and the camouflage of opposite opposing forces. And this was even before the war had even started. This operation uh, went on. So it appears that there were quite a few covert operations that were involved in the Gulf War and that some of them may have broken certain codes of war and also will explain certain things like why they were so smart and precision, these bombs in the beginning, and why they became uh, dumber later. Gee, all those ethical, ethical questions are really going to keep uh, Bush and all his uh, buddy psychopaths uh, up uh, sleepless nights, aren't they? Well, it, it may uh, restrain them from putting a war crime charges against Saddam Hussein because of some of the way that they um, carried on the war were brought to light, they would also be guilty of violating a lot of these uh, Geneva code in the uh, war crimes laws. Guardian of March 6, 1991, talks about a study which was done at the University of Massachusetts at, in their Center for Studies in Communication. The, and it, regarding the Gulf War, and probably the conclusions are not too surprising. It says it showed that the more TV news people watched, the more they supported the war, and the less they knew what was going on, and the less they knew about the Middle East. For instance, when they asked what the State Department had done in July 1990 when Iraq indicated that it might use force against Iraq, 74% of the people said that United States had threatened sanctions against Iraq. Sixty-five percent said the administration pledged to support Kuwait with the use of force, and only 13 percent gave the right answer, and that was that the United States had informed uh, Saddam Hussein that it had no position on the matter and he could do what he wanted to. They, uh, they wouldn't take any action. The authors concluded that the news media have consequently failed in their duty to be objective, and uh, because they uh, appear to be communicating facts that only support the administration's policies and playing down those who do not say that. Those guys took a big study from the University of Massachusetts to come to a conclusion like that. <laughs> They're brilliant, aren't they? Wow! That the news media aren't uh, uh, objective and that they support the administration? Whew. Well, liberals think this is a great uh, triumph to reveal <laughs> these biases and that the media only uses sources from the military, the establishment, the Bush administration, and so on, and they don't go to uh, leftists.
or uh, left liberals for information, for points of view. <laughs> they think that this is a tremendous uh, critique of the um, media. Also, the uh, other side, the flip side of that is, and I've heard them actually say this on TV, particularly NPR, it said, well, now that these things have been exposed, people will certainly be hesitant to do that in the future. <laughs> Never stopped anybody yet, has it? Crazy. Well, Frank, this um, discussion that we're now having is put in an interesting context in an article by Craig Hewlett called The Secret U.S. Agenda of the Gulf War that indicates that in April of 1990, there was a White House conference, a meeting of members of the ruling classes of all the European countries, and they put out a task force report on this conference, and it was published by Derek Fitzgerald, the former Prime Minister of Ireland, who wanted people to know what was discussed at this conference. And according to this article, this analysis by Craig Hewlett, who's a former military um, defense analyst who is now an independent researcher working in Seattle, Washington, with a group KC and Associates, that's a group of retired intelligence officers, military people, generals, and some former national security uh, administration people are now criticizing, as John Stockwell did, their former employees, and they have published an analysis of the Gulf War from the context of this uh, report that was published in April of 1990 that said that the Middle East needs to be completely disarmed, that the ballistic missiles, the conventional weapons, the nuclear, the chemical, everything has to be taken out, and that the main threat to stability of the region is Saddam Hussein and his military machine, and it needs to be destroyed completely in order to guarantee the stability of the region. They talked about how this could be done through the UN and through utilizing some sort of UN resolutions to try to demilitarize the Middle East, and they came to the conclusion this is impractical. Only through a war could the military machine of Saddam Hussein be destroyed. And according to Hulet, this consensus that was built up among the power elites of these European countries would explain why in the United Nations Bush was able to get all of these countries that are usually squabbling right behind him to pass all of these rev resolutions. That they'd already agreed that Saddam Hussein's military was a menace to the peace, the stability, which means the flow of oil and the control by U.S. and European interests of that region for their own ends, and that therefore the, he needed to be taken out. Now, what's chilling about this when you think of it in the, the context of the future is that they concluded that all of these military machines, Syria, Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, that all of these military regimes were a threat and that the military had to be completely eliminated in every one of these regimes. What about Israel? They, they don't mention uh -huh. Israel, which yeah. is, of course, uh, the Cat. biggest military machine in the region with the most nuclear weapons, chemical, biological. In fact, when they kept saying that Iraq during the Persian Gulf War had the fourth largest military machine in the world, they conveniently left uh, Israel mm -hmm. out of this that has a much larger military machine than um, Iraq. We'll have more news later, but now let's see Susan and Edward DeBrava's documentary, Human Rights in El Salvador. On November 5, 1990, congressional legislation was signed into law, freezing 50% of U.S. aid to the military of El Salvador. Release of the aid is based in part on the U.S. State Department's evaluation of the human rights performance of both sides in the 11-year-old Civil War. Many of the incidents in the following report from El Salvador occurred during the period November 29th through December 13th, 1990, when this newly passed U.S. legislation required the State Department to closely monitor and evaluate the actions of both the FMLN and the Salvadoran government and its military. The Salvadoran Military's Information Agency, COPREFA, refused our requests for an interview.
The government's human rights agency canceled a scheduled interview. The U.S. Embassy would not allow a videotaped interview. Many of the Salvadorans we spoke to would not allow their full names and identities to be used for fear of reprisals by Salvadoran military and security forces. The people of El Salvador are caught in a web of terror, trapped between the military forces of the Arena government and the guerrilla forces of the FMLN. No one is safe in this civil war. Over the last 11 years, the United States has sent more than $4 billion in aid to El Salvador's military forces and government. Over these same 11 years, more than 75,000 civilians have been killed or disappeared. Thousands more have been tortured. Today, the Salvadoran people continue to suffer as a persistent pattern of brutal human rights violations grips the nation. Who's behind the killings, the disappearances, the torture? Has USAID contributed to peace and democracy in El Salvador, or merely strengthened a military regime that wages low-intensity warfare on its own citizens? The answers to these questions may determine the future status of USAID to El Salvador. Who's abusing the Salvadoran people? The government and military, or the FMLN? Amnesty International says the great majority of the human rights violations are committed by the ARENA government and its military forces. But the torture that the government does and some of the bodies that we've seen have had uh, the faces chopped away, the faces burned, the eyeballs gouged out, uh, cigarette burnings, uh, electrical shocks, cigarettes uh, on the genitals and the breasts of women, uh, repeated rapes, uh, humiliation. But Salvadoran President Cristiani's chief of staff blames the FMLN. The FMLN is a hardcore, uh, violent, very violent, Marxist-Leninist organization that is an amalgamation of five different uh, guerrilla groups. But civilians living in the countryside say government forces attack them. The village of San Simon is in the state of Usulután. It lies along the Lempa River, where Salvadoran armed forces massacred 200 civilians, mostly women and children, in 1981. Residents of San Simón say government forces in U.S. supplied planes and helicopters bomb and strafe them an average of two to four times a year. When we visited San Simón on December 9, 1990, the village had been attacked that morning. Here we are very sad. Our community is full of children and adults, and the helicopter was attacking us toward our cooperative. And here we are, between the rock and the hard place, suffering. The walls of the San Simón school are pocked with bullet holes from a previous attack by government military forces. Villagers say a teacher and two children were inside at the time. North of San Simón, teenage girls are reportedly being raped by members of the Salvadoran military. A social worker says the women are threatened with death if they report these crimes. Up to now, we don't know one case where the rape has been caused by the FMLN. All the cases mentioned before have been caused by the army, the government army. The army comes into the villages pretending to attack guerrillas and have a shootout. They are all lies. They come into the homes, take the young girls out any time, and they rape them. Then they threaten them, and they make sure they know that if they say a word, they will be killed, and their families will be killed. Out of fear, those girls say nothing. The rural hamlet of La Mora in the state of Cuscatlan was bombed by the Salvadoran military on November 29, 1990. Seven U.S. supplied planes rocketed and machine gunned the town. Grenades exploded on rooftops as terrorized residents huddled inside. The ceiling in this bedroom was ripped open as children lay on the bed below. Residents of La Mora blame the military for these and similar attacks. But the Minister of the Interior says it's the FMLN that attacks civilians, especially during their second offensive. With the many children, the many old people, with the many women, including pregnant women, that died in this offensive. These are not military targets. 
Down the road, another resident of La Mora points out the damages to his home. He says nearly 100 soldiers bombed his property and terrorized his family for seven hours. The woman who lives here says that more than 30 soldiers stormed her house as bombs were falling nearby. She said they fired into the home where she and her family were hiding and then accused them of collaborating with the guerrillas. We said we don't collaborate with either side. But they said, that's not true. You don't collaborate with us. But they collaborate with the guerrilla. That's not true. With nobody. So nobody can accuse us of collaborating with the other side. That's what we said to them. But then they took my husband. They took him to interrogate him. Wana joined a group of Salvadorans and Americans requesting that the U.S. Embassy protect La Mora from further attacks by the military. The group asked an embassy human rights officer to visit the village and document the damage. In the capital city of San Salvador, the human rights of students, labor leaders, teachers, priests, and nuns are also being violated. The Arena Party says it's because they're members of the FMLN. Then you have union people, uh, students are very much uh, members of the FMLN, and then you have intellectuals, uh, leftist intellectuals who are also are members of the FMLN. So it's an amalgamation of different groups. But Amnesty International disagrees. What they try to do is first, as, they, uh, as the military talks about, is they try to cut off the head of the opposition. Sometimes those may be the union leaders, it may be the students, it may be the teachers, it may be the priests, the nuns, the religious workers that they go after. They try to take away the moral authority or those people who talk about justice. And then they go after everybody else. On top of what you have there in that country is you have uh, some random killings, some torture being done by the guerrillas, which unleashes even more torture and death by uh, the extreme right and by the death squads and by the government. A woman who works with the 10,000 residents of San Salvador left homeless by a major earthquake in 1986 describes how she was tortured by the Salvadoran military. So they start patching you here and there on your head, everywhere, blindfolded, tied up. So we had to stand there for 72 hours without sleeping, without eating, without drinking a drop of water, standing up without moving, because if out of exhaustion you fell, they start kicking you all over again. The last day they put the plastic hood on my head. They threw in this hood, cigarette smoke and snot. They put it on my head tight. Two men sat on me, my hands tied. I felt I was being strangled. I couldn't breathe any longer. They put that hood on five times. The fifth time I said, please stop torturing me. I, can, I cannot say what you want me to say I am because I am not who you say I am. And if you feel I'm a burden to the society, kill me, kill me, I yelled. I couldn't almost talk any longer at that point. That's when the torture stopped. That's the torture they do there in the military quarters, in the Hacienda Police, the National Police, the National Guard, and all the military posts. And the torture they inflict on people only because of voicing what they need, asking for what we need, working to survive. For that they torture us, and that's what our armed forces and our government are all about. Another persecuted group is Comadres, 500 women who try to find those killed who disappeared. What people have to understand in a country like El Salvador, you can be considered dangerous to the government if you are just raising questions about the disappearance of your family member. They seek to punish the assassins and provide support and medical services to the families and orphans of the disappeared. Two women were killed when Comadre's headquarters was bombed in 1989. The group's director says she was raped repeatedly by a military officer while imprisoned. It's awful. It's repulsive. He said, I'm going to rape you, but you better not tell anybody about it tomorrow. I said, if you don't do it, I won't tell. You don't have to do it.
I began to fight him because I was angry. But he took off my clothes. And he was saying, do you like it? He caressed me and pinch me. And how do I explain? It's something difficult to understand. I try not to be affected by it. When he was done, he hugged me and said, maybe I won't let you leave because I liked it. The offices of FENASTRAS, the National Federation of Salvadoran Trade Unions, was bombed by the Salvadoran military in October 1989. Ten people were literally blown to pieces and many more were injured. Juan Jose Hueso, a director of the Federation, was imprisoned for a year and a half and tortured. It's true that several points presented by the FMLN coincide with our points. Sure, we agree with some of their ideas, but that doesn't mean that we're part of the FMLN. This has been a struggle supported by the government to make us look like a front for the MFLN. But that's not true. We have our own legal recognition. We are recognized by the Ministry of Labor. And we don't carry arms. Our arms are the labor code and the several petitions for revindications. But the government, in order to justify its repression, to justify its terrorist actions against us, say we are the FMLN. Many Americans don't know what's done with their tax money. Their taxes are used to bomb houses full of children, old people and women. And they don't know it. The Salvadoran government's Minister of the Interior acknowledges the military has committed atrocities against the civilian population. But he says it's the work of a few rogue officers. Because there have been occurrences which are horrible, distasteful, in which certain elements of the Salvadoran military have been involved. And this is very unfortunate because there is not a distinction made between the entire military institution and some of the occurrences of certain elements of the army. And it's not an institutionalized practice, although some people might see it that way. This is an isolated incidents of certain people, just as in organizations all around the world, certain incidences might occur involving people who are a member of certain organizations, but do not involve the organization itself. Again, Amnesty International disagrees, saying the military's problem is widespread and systemic. Well, it is very systemic, and uh, it's systemic in the fact that the government is uh, has allowed it to go on, uh, they've uh, used it to their advantage and they've participated in it. It is part of the system in El Salvador. It has not changed in the last 10 years. On the side of the assassinations of the six priests killed by Salvadoran military forces in November 1989, we spoke with a colleague of the slain Jesuits. We asked Father Rogelio Pedros, who fears for his life on a daily basis, why the priests were killed. Because they were who couldn't be silent with the reasons. Because they were there and couldn't be accused of anything. They had no legal reason to take them to the court. They had no legal reason to jail them or deport them. So they killed them. As this university says, for being at the service of the Salvadorian people, or for trying to make the injustice a little bit less. The U.S. Congress cut a portion of its aid to El Salvador, in part because the Salvadoran government wasn't conducting a thorough investigation of the massacre of the priests. But the Arena government says the investigation has been professional and complete. We are now in the midst of implementing a judicial reform process in this country. It is not something that you can do overnight. But nevertheless, we feel extremely, extremely pleased with the way that the judicial system in general, and Judge Zamora in particular, has handled this case. The Interior Minister agrees, saying international experts approved of the way the investigation was conducted. But Amnesty International doesn't see it that way. Uh, we have yet to see 
a full investigation. What the government has tried to do on publicly notable cases is to single out some soldiers and say they were the ones responsible. Lower when, echelon. Lower echelon individuals when really, in fact, the decisions everyone knows came at a higher level. We would ask that, uh, that uh, the government allow individual uh, investigators to go in and to provide the information and to see that uh, the perpetrators were prosecuted. I don't think this will happen under the present government. Has U.S. foreign aid furthered the cause of peace in El Salvador? Its government says yes, but most Salvadorans we spoke to say no. A political opposition leader comments on American aid and the cause of peace. The reason why we have been waging a war, one of the most important reasons why we have been waging a war for more than 10 years, because of American aid. Uh, so in that sense, I would say that uh, uh, American aid with the American taxpayer has not helped for peace, but just the opposite too. Help for more destruction, more prolongation of suffering and war. Dr. Ungo also says it takes more than an election to make a democracy. It doesn't have any valid that uh, we have free elections and we don't have democratic elections. I mean, there is not just important to win, but the winner has power and not the power remains in the hands of the army. So the votes are the real source of power and not the guns. Despite the documentation of ongoing human rights violations against Salvadoran civilians, perpetrated mostly by the Salvadoran military, and despite the fact that the Arena government either cannot or will not stop this abuse, and despite the fact that the State Department has been mandated to monitor and report human rights abuses by both the Salvadoran military and the FMLN, President Bush authorized the release of $42.5 million in military aid to El Salvador on January 15, 1991. Reporting from El Salvador, Susan DeBrava for Behind the Headlines. We turn now to an interview with Charlie McMartin, who is a member of the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, CISPACE. He gives us more recent information. While the Iraq uh, war has been going on, we've seen almost nothing about Central America. But in terms of understanding what's been going on the first four or five months of this year, it's important to go back to November 1990. Um, at that stage, the FMLN a year earlier had demonstrated to the Army um, and to the U.S. Um, that they still had the military capacity, uh, which had been questioned by the military, questioned by the Reagan and Bush administrations. And in that offensive of, of November 1989, they had demonstrated they still have the capacity on the ground. By no November 1990, this past November, um, that left the, the army, the Salvadorian army, um, with its air force as a decisive element in terms of being able to, uh, to maintain itself um, at the negotiation tables um, without giving any concessions um, to the armed opposition, to the FMLN. The FMLN was able to um, essentially dismantle, as they say in, in Spanish, to disarticulate the, the Air Force's capacity um, to defend its ground troops. Um, they did that both with surface-to-air missiles and with the threat of surface-to-air missiles. Um, there's even an interesting anecdote um, from this period, November and December of last year, when the, the helicopter pilots in El Salvador began to organize themselves and say, we will not fly um, in the country unless um, the Army can guarantee our family members um, complete support um, if we get 
if we get killed. And so there was essentially a split began to develop between the, the Air Force, which is saying, look, you know, we're not going to fly um, if we're going to risk getting shot down. And, and the Army troops, the ground troops of the, of the Salvadorian Army was saying that, um, well, we really need this support. And the Air Force was saying, well, you should be able to be um, efficient enough without our support. And the sum total was is that by uh, January of this year, uh, the army was forced back to the negotiating table in a serious way. And this put negotiations as essentially much more much more strategically important for the FMLN in terms of wrestling concessions out of the army. Because the central blocking point in terms of resolving the, the 11 years civil war in El Salvador has been the army's willingness to go back and investigate and to admit the human rights violations um, it has been guilty of. Um, during the past 11 years. And so this was the, the central concession um, that, was, that was really hoped for, and that this would lead in turn to a uh, ceasefire um, during this year. Now, the, the current round of negotiations, which just um, ended in April, really gave the, the biggest hope for the people of El Salvador for ending the Civil War. There had been tremendous pressure from both inside and outside the country. Um, the Archbishop of the country had said in a number of homilies that any political force within the country that um, aspires to represent the majority of Salvadorians has to recognize that the broadest consensus is a desire for peace. Um, and so this is what the, the FMLN recognizing had, had said, okay, we're going to put down our our traditional demand of political agreements before a ceasefire, before we lay down our weapons, um, and essentially go at them simultaneously to try to get the political um, agreements while simultaneously developing the conditions for a ceasefire. Well, this didn't happen last month, that is April, um, in El Salvador because of principally two reasons. One was uh, a backlash from the far right who, interestingly enough, accused Cristiani, and uh, Cristiani is the president of El Salvador. Um, Who's a member of the right-wing arena party. Right, exactly. And um, one that you would think would be in tune with the right wing, mm -hmm. but... They began to be accused by, the, um, by a number of far right groups of selling out the selling out the country there was a paid advertisement in one of the right wing papers in El Salvador that appeared in the obituary column that said um, anyone who sells out our country by conceding anything to the FMLN will find their names and their photographs here um, the second primary the second primary obstacle to to any uh, uh, definitive uh, conclusion to the, the, the Civil War last month was the United States Embassy um, and the United States government which it represents. The United States for the first four months of 1991's um, approach to negotiations can, was at best ambivalent. Indeed the UN, um, the head of the United Nations for the negotiations in El Salvador had said that um, he was extremely disappointed by the United States. Um, and recognize it as a primary obstacle. Some examples of that was, for instance, uh, uh, press statements were leaked out of the State Department saying that the United Nations was siding with the FMLN. Um, Colin Powell um, visited El Salvador and Honduras um, during April and said that, well, if negotiations aren't successful, then El Salvador can be solved the way uh, the Persian Gulf crisis was solved. Which is exactly what the right wing wanted to hear, that there would be mm -hmm. U.S. military support mm -hmm. for a final offensive against mm -hmm. the rebels, that the U.S. would support this kind of action. Right, because the military solution clear, clearly benefits certain sectors of El Salvador society. Um, there are certain military leaders within the Salvadorian army who essentially developed their own economy. Um, through the billions of dollars that have been sent down by the United States, which continues to be at about a million dollars a day. They have their own banks, they have their own businesses, um, and they have certainly benefited from um, a military crisis, a political crisis within their country. And any type of talk of a ceasefire and negotiations is a threat to them um, and to their whole legitimacy for being. And uh, so both those along with the United States um, remain the obstacles. Now there is the opportunity for uh, 
a message to be sent by the United States government in support of negotiations, and that would be primarily through uh, a bill before Congress which would cut off all war-related aid to El Salvador that's being sponsored by Senator Adams um, and Representative McDermott. And that would essentially cut off all aid until there is um, a final ceasefire in El Salvador. Well, this is just something that's intolerable for the military right wing in, in El Salvador. And um, Cristiani himself um, backslid on some of his positions um, for a ceasefire and negotiated solution to the war and had an editorial um, last week. Um, um, in the Washington Post calling for a continuation of aid and how um, somehow paradoxically that negotiations can be aided by continued military aid. What about humanitarian aid? Susan and Edward de Brava have compiled a documentary report on the success of this type of assistance in reaching its designated recipients in El Salvador. Adding humanitarian aid to the people in a country like El Salvador is a problem. Inadequate monitoring of aid distribution, civil war, and government corruption make it difficult to get the aid where it's needed. An assistant to U.S. Congressman George Brown says most U.S. non-lethal aid ends up in Salvadoran military coffers. That leaves the, the other 320 million as economic and developmental assistance, and studies have shown that approximately three quarters of that 320 million really go toward military purposes in the war effort. So it leaves really only about 80 million dollars out of 400 million dollars that get, goes to, towards anything that can be called developmental assistance. And unfortunately the people I saw down here uh, this past week told me they've never seen any U.S. aid or even any Salvadoran government aid. If the U.S. government can't or won't get aid to those who desperately need it, can the large international relief organizations deliver? An American doctor who's been delivering medical aid to El Salvador for 10 years says no because the high-profile relief organizations try to remain apolitical. There are organizations that try to do that, like the International Committee of the Red Cross, like DRI, like uh, UNICEF, but unless one is willing to get in El Salvador and confront the government with their practices, it's very hard to, to carry out those missions, and most, most agencies aren't willing to, to involve themselves to that extent, because confronting the government, even in a, in a respectful way based on international law, is to invite being labeled a subversive. The director of Santa Barbara-based Direct Relief International says aid can find its mark if the distribution is monitored. You have a lot of leverage because you can restrict your donations by virtue of saying if we don't have control, if we don't have documentation, if you won't allow us to spot check, then basically we'll go somewhere else. The DRI admits it has no staff in El Salvador and relies on written reports, photographs, and pre-announced visits to verify the aid deliveries. And sometimes the system breaks down. Take, for instance, the case of humanitarian aid raised at Santa Barbara's Beachside Festival. Clothing manufacturers George Ann and Mylan Melvin raise thousands of dollars every year for the people in El Salvador. They convince their garment industry pals to donate merchandise, and all the proceeds go to help those ravaged by the Salvadoran Civil War. In 1989, they gave $20,000 to DRI and earmarked it for specific Salvadoran clinics. DRI gave it to the Salvadoran American Foundation, or FUSAM, to disperse. The shipment went down, and it turned out that it was not distributed to our clinics, and we were very upset. Carlos attributes the snafu to miscommunication and says she hasn't had a problem with FUSAM since then. Mylon Melvin says he was disappointed, but not surprised, since the president's wife sits on the FUSAM board. Um, president Cristiani's wife is involved with it. So that means that, it, that the aid was already politicized in the sense that uh, it has gone to an organization that works with the right-wing military government in El Salvador. Carlos claims Mrs. Cristiani helps raise funds for FUSAM and isn't involved with policy decisions. Melvin's decided to try a different route after the 1990 Beachside Festival. They decided to deliver the aid themselves. 
The aid was sent to San Antonio, Texas and put in trucks as part of a Pastors for Peace caravan. The aid made its way through Mexico without a hitch and the caravan continued through Guatemala without incident. No problems arose until they reached the Salvadoran border. Sharon and I just been informed that, that Sharon, myself, Joel Hackle, and Lucius, when he arrived, they're not going to be allowed into El Salvador. Leader Tom Hansen and three other caravan members were denied entry into the country despite prior approval and visas. But caravan participants were prepared for trouble and quickly moved into nonviolent civil disobedience right in the immigration office. <laughs> Their perseverance prevailed, and after 48 hours of bureaucratic delay, the caravan and its cargo were allowed into El Salvador. The humanitarian aid was then held up in customs for several more days in San Salvador. When the aid was finally released, the Melvins and the church people and human rights activists from the caravan began delivering the aid to non-governmental agencies, or NGOs as they're called. Many self-help Salvadoran citizen groups say NGOs have a better track record than the government of getting aid to the people. But the vice minister to the Salvadoran president warns of distributing aid through NGOs. What you must guard against is in organizations or individuals who present themselves uh, to represent the poor and who may actually funnel in aid to terrorists. That is one thing you should guard against. But a man who works in the countryside with the desperately poor says aid channel through NGOs stays within the communities. When you talk about, when someone will say that the aid that the, the community has received through uh, NGOs that will end up in the hands of the, uh, of the uh, subversive, I think that, again, is just a political uh, justification of trying to, to control all, any, any aid that may come to the country. The Salvadoran Minister of the Interior says humanitarian aid should go through the government and not to specific communities. Sometimes when aid comes that is as a specific destination, that could create some problems because there might be some communities who might need this aid more than the communities where the aid has been destined to. But the Melvins chose to avoid going through the government. The only aid getting down here is military aid. I don't care. You can call it human. The Americans can call it humanitarian, or they can call it their mammy if they want to. But it is not getting to the people down here in any form other than the military. The first group to receive aid from the Melvins were the residents of Soledad, left homeless by a major earthquake in 1986. A social worker says the 500 families who have set up camp on top of the city dump never received any of the 129 million dollars sent by the U.S. after the quake. We honestly know the money is in the hands of the government. They gave most of the money, the medicine, and the food to the armed forces. The comadres denounce human rights abuse. They help the families of the killed and disappeared. They give food and medicine to those who need them. And they appreciate the humanitarian aid. The American people are beautiful. They keep what they have. They keep what they can. It's dangerous for these people to even receive humanitarian aid. While this aid was being delivered, there was an undercover policeman across the street photographing the whole event. The Melvins also designated aid for three villages in the countryside. The pueblos are populated by Salvadoran refugees from the Civil War who fled to Honduras and have recently returned to what's left of their land. The people who live in San Simón Usulután are rebuilding. The Melvins gave them money to finish this school. Malnutrition is rampant in Chalatenango. Los Almendras, La Mora, and Valle Verde received aid to increase their ability to feed themselves.
The people who live here in this community will be receiving aid raised by the Beachside Festival. They'll be getting clothing, medicine, a tractor, and a truck to take their produce to market. The people in the town of Valle Verde planned a reception for their compadres at Flamingo Design, the Melvins. But like most foreigners, the government wouldn't allow the Melvins out in the countryside. The people were disappointed. What you've just seen about the delivery of humanitarian aid in El Salvador is happening all around the world. Either government corruption and civil war will have to be brought under control, or the world will have to reshape its aid delivery system, particularly because world disasters are growing at a faster rate than world finances. Reporting from El Salvador, Susan DeBrava for Behind the Headlines. The New York Times reported on June 27, 1991, that the Bush administration released $27 million of your tax money for the Salvadoran Armed Forces. Three days after the most recent round of elections in El Salvador, um, workers and the Treasury Ministry of El Salvador um, held a strike um, to try to get wage concessions, uh, about $50 a month additional uh, wages. They were fired upon and their leaders were uh, captured by the, um, by the Salvadorian army. And one of the uh, members of that union I spoke to by phone um, said that, again, in a very exasperated uh, tone, said that this is just so typical that uh, the United States is providing the bullets and we're providing the bodies. Let's return now to some perspectives on the Gulf War from the alternative press. Henry B. Gonzalez is the person in Congress who I guess has been the most steadfast and the most uh, uh, visible in his opposition to the Gulf War and the Bush policies from start to finish. There are articles in the Spotlight and also in American Atheist. The Spotlight indicates that, that in addition to all the other bills which the United States are going to have to pay concerning the Gulf War. Uh, Gonzalez says that the funds provided for loan for agriculture purposes actually went, the ones that we made to Iraq, actually went for military uh, uh, purchases. And of course these types of things, it's going to be about two billion dollars, is going to have to be picked up by the taxpayer. And he says also that the president bribed, intimidated, and threatened members of the United Nations Security Council to support this. They just weren't there for to take care of an aggressor. That uh, he had to like Johnny Appleseed, only this time it was money he was spreading around. Uh, the debt to uh, Egypt was forgiven. $140 million in loans were uh, given to China. Soviet Union was promised $7 billion. Colombia was promised assistance to its armed forces. Zaire was promised military assistance and a partial forgiveness of its debt. Saudi Arabia was promised $12 billion in arms. Yemen was threatened with the termination of support if it didn't uh, line up on the side of the United States, and this actually uh, turned out to be the case. And uh, the, uh, Gonzalez doesn't mention in here, but also the spotlight in previous articles mention a billion and a half or so to uh, keep uh, Assad, the Syrian dictator, happy, and a few several millions to the Turks to keep them on the side. So it was just uh, pure bribery to get these people to line up on the side of the allies. And finally, the U.S., you know, the U.S. has been $187 million in debt to the U.N. and hadn't paid its dues in all these years. Well, it paid that up, $187 million to go along with the rest of it. Henry B. Gonzalez also released information linking Deputy Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger, National Security Council Director Brent Scowcroft, and Henry B or Henry uh, Kissinger, not uh, Henry B, but Henry uh, K, to the uh, Banca Nacionale del Lavoro scandal in which uh, employees of the BNL allegedly loaned $4 billion to Iraq.
some of which was used for military purposes. Wow, that's new. I hadn't heard about that. The way the regular media had this set up was just some foreign bank down there that right, was doing but, all this. But some of the top people, including uh, Brent uh, Scowcroft, who was second to Bush in pushing for this war, all the analyses, the insider stories that I've read about who is really pushing within the establishment the Persian Gulf War indicates that Bush was the biggest, pushing it from the very beginning. And right behind him was Brent uh, Scowcroft, who had been involved in all kinds of financial groups that had interests in the um, region. The more explosive connection with uh, Brent uh, Scowcroft came out in this pamphlet by Craig Hewlett, The Secret Agenda in the Gulf War, that pointed out that the Kuwaitis had $300 billion invested in the United States. This was one reason why, obviously, the United States was not going to let Iraq take Kuwait over, not only because of the control of oil, but the Kuwaiti assets are just multi-billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, of which $300 billion is is invested in the United States. The Kuwaitis own $52 billion in U.S. T-bonds, T-bills and bonds. Their city court portfolio is $10 billion in assets, and they hold significant amounts of stock in General Electric, McDonnell Douglas, Westinghouse, Dow Chemical, Atlantic Richfield, Texaco, etc., particularly specializing in oil and defense industry investments. Now, there's something else that the Kuwaitis did, and that is they set up a U.S. corporation that was completely owned 100 percent by Kuwait Petroleum that in turn is owned exclusively by the Al-Sabah family. The Santa Fe International is a big multinational corporation that owns 275 oil and gas leases on 250,000 acres of U.S. government land. It also has connections with defense contractors and other industries and other businesses, as do most uh, multinationals. Guess who was on the uh, board of directors of Santa Fe International? One of their first board of directors was President Gerald Ford, who named his friend George Bush CIA director. They also put on that, the board of that corporation Brent Scowcroft, who at that time was an aide in 1970, uh, um, when he, he was formerly an aide to uh, Gerald Ford, who's now the head of the national, um, uh, he's now the national security advisor. Also on the board was uh, Carla Hill's husband, Roderick uh, Hill. Carla Hill is the trade representative in the uh, Bush administration, who is the HUD secretary under the Ford administration. So these top people in the power structure had tremendous investments in the Santa Fe International. They were on the board of directors of this uh, corporation. So they were pushing their own economic interests when they were supporting the uh, Persian Gulf War. And Henry B. Gonzalez was the only one who was uh, speaking mm -hmm. out on this kind of connection in um, um, Congress. And then with the uh need to have reconstruction in Kuwait, who's going to get the contracts, it's the uh, big American corporations, and a lot of these same people and their buddies are on the board of directors of those. Right. George Schultz, who was the former Secretary of State, came out of the Bechtel Corporation and is still involved with that corporation, as was Caspar Weinberger, right. who was Reagan's Secretary of Defense, who was one of the great defenders of the Gulf War. You saw him on television pushing the total destruction of Iraq and the liberation of Kuwait so that Bechtel could get uh, corporation contracts to rebuild the uh, country. Schultz was told before the war even started that there was going to be a major military action that would probably lead to the destruction of Kuwait. They were prepared to have Kuwait totally destroyed. That brings us to the end of this Alternative Views frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on alternative views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas 78713. You must send a 
self-addressed stamped envelope. We also can provide you with information on how to get some of the publications of former CIA officer John Stockwell. We'd like to thank our crew for the program. Eric Eubank was on camera, Kevin L. West was the audio man, and particularly we'd like to thank Susan and Edward DeBrava for letting us use their documentary footage from their public access program in Santa Barbara, California, behind the headlines. Their address is 1623 Garden Street, number 3, Santa Barbara, California, 93101. Our address is the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. So you've got a lot of addresses you can write to. Bye.